Welcome listeners to a brand new bonus episode of Oh My Word Podcast. And today we have a really special treat because we have an author, Angela Ruth Strong, who is an author specifically... Okay, well, you know, you're going to hear. You're going to find out. But we haven't had an author like this on before, so everyone gets so excited. Angela, welcome to the podcast. Wow, you made me sound exciting. You are exciting. All right. I'll prove it to everyone now. I wasn't going to say it right away, but now we'll let you do the big reveal. What are the kind of books you're writing? So I mostly write romance, and I'm writing romantic comedy right now. And I think what you're leading up to is the fact that I had a book made into a movie. Is that what you're going for? That's one thing. That's one thing we're going okay. for. But I think I didn't misread this. Some of your books, or out of all them books, are also you have like Christian romances out. Yeah, so Christian romance, clean romance. The lines kind of blur there a little bit because we don't want to be preachy. So anybody interested in clean romance, I think it'll fit well. Right, so two parts of it. The movie part is one, and the clean Mm -hmm. romance part. We're curious about that because it sounds like, how can you do both? But we'll ask. Before we even start that, (laughs) how did you get into writing? Why was it, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write these books. How did that all even start? Well, my mom was a writer growing up, so she wrote stories. Like, she'd write something about me and send it into Women's World, and (laughs) there'd be an article about me in Women's World, and she'd send, like, a picture with a really horrible haircut. Um, (laughs) Thanks, Mom. So I just grew up thinking that's what you do when you write something, you send it into a magazine. And I was cheerleading in high school, and a basketball player ran into me and knocked me into the bleachers, and I broke four ribs. So I wrote about it. And I was like, hey, mom, help me send this to American Cheerleader magazine. So they paid me $100. And at the age of 16, that was like the easiest money I'd ever made. So I I decided to go study journalism in college. And it's never been that easy since. And then I started my family young. So I would take my kids to story time all the time. And I started writing stories for them. And they were published in magazines like Hopscotch. And so then as they got a little bit older and were doing their own reading, like their summer reading programs, I'm doing the adult summer reading programs thinking, hey, I want to do this i want to write for people like me so that's how it started well it's funny you just made it sound so straightforward and simple but it's literally i went to college studied writing specifically in journalism and then after that i just kept writing the stories and send them to magazines wrote the stories and send them to magazines baby steps out first so lots of rejections along the way though you just like the, the story i sold the hopscotch i sent it to them one time and they rejected it and then i sent it another time and they accepted it so sometimes you, it's it's about the skill but it's also about the tenacity there wasn't a thought of, oh, I want to be an actual journalist. It was just, this is the, the form of writing that interests me? Or you thought magazine writing meant journalism? Well, I wanted to do magazine writing, which is journalism. But because I started my family so young, I was staying home with them, the kids. And writing was something I could do while raising them, like during nap time. I feel like I've seen a lot of articles of, uh, how do you balance work and raising children and da 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 whatever. You're like, nap time. That's when we write. That's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just start my own career. Yeah. So these stories then, it seems you were going toward fiction then after yes. at that point. So I wrote my first novel and I took it to a conference in 2006. I got an agent there. I wrote a second book. She was trying to pitch those. And meanwhile, they started a series of books called Love Finds You. And so they're set all across the nation, written by all different authors, Love Finds You, in, and then, you know, a name of a resort town, pretty much. All you had to do to pitch one of those was write three chapters and a synopsis. So I seriously threw it together in a day and forgot about it. And when my agent called me to tell me that I'd sold a book, I expected it to be one of the two books that I'd spent years working on and it was this one that i'd never even written yet oh my goodness when you said like you threw it together in a, in a day are you also saying that because you know the words just came out or was yeah. it oh wow okay. no it just came out like i don't now i count my word count back then i didn't i just did it you know i had a, a smaller limited amount of time back then because my kids were sleeping so i was like okay i have to get this done now right. i'm my life is a little more laid back but yeah i threw it together and sent it out and then when my agent called me and said if they want to publish your I had to go back and read the synopsis because I didn't even remember what I was writing about. Most writers don't get started that way and I was kind of spoiled because I had a hardback copy. It was in Costco and and some of these books started getting made into movies. It was a great way to start my career. Wow, yeah, amazing. Okay, let's let's go back for a second. When did you decide or why did you decide I'm not going to do the magazine stories anymore? I actually want to write a novel. 
Well, I think because my mom had been a writer and she sold lots of magazine stories, but she hadn't ever been able to sell a book. She'd come really close. So I think a lot of people, when they get started writing, they either think this is going to be impossible or it's going to be super easy. But I feel like because of my mom's experience, I knew like somewhere in the middle, it's hard, but it's doable. Okay. And so I just decided I was, I had this idea and I was like, I'm just going to do it. And I got started based on what I'd read in novels, you know, I kind of, and then along the way I had to study how to write and right. figure it out along the way. Yeah, that's a good point. And once you start with the novels, it's always been the clean romance or have you tried other genres? Well, it's mostly been clean romance. So after I sold that first book and I hadn't written it yet, right. um, that was in 2008 when I got that contract and then my husband left me. Oh my God. And I had to write this romance novel as my marriage was falling apart. So I had to, yeah, I know. And I was like, love is a fairy tale. So, stupid. <laughs> so I had to finish it. And then after that, I didn't want to write romance anymore. So I wrote a kids series called The Water Fight Professional. There's four books in that series. And that was really fun because I got to share that with my kids and go to their classrooms and read it to their classes. And I've been able to do lots of school visits and mayor's book clubs and stuff like that. But then once I met my husband now, I was like, love changes lives. So yeah, now I'm writing romance again. <laughs> wait, 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 wait a second. Wow, so much to unpack. I'm going to focus on something that's not as big first. The Water okay. Fight Professional, that is hilarious. And I can't believe that hasn't been done before because water fights are just a staple almost so many people have been in some sort of water fight before super fun right it's, how did no one do that yet and then you do that that's amazing yeah so i have a, a screenplay writer director friend who's looked at it and thinking about making it into a movie and i feel like out of all everything i've written like this story the water fight professional could have the biggest i mean you could sell water guns like with the water fight professional on it like there's there's a lot of potential there so i'm not doing that anymore but i do believe that's something else will happen with that series yeah tell your friend to stop thinking and to start doing yeah. yeah well the publisher that you've been out with these are all through your agents landing you in big time houses just smaller traditional houses very genre specific houses I've been with a few different houses. The first one that I said got me into Costco and everything, they ended up selling to another company that ended up shutting them down. <laughs> I got my rights back for that one, but that was the Love Finds You line, and that's where my movie connection came in because it had been optioned for film. And so another writer who'd written for that series, she's like, hey, Angela, I'm going to get my rights back and reprint these and start a publishing house because I have the producer connection. So why don't you join me and we can get our books made into movies so she is a smaller traditional press and i went with her because she had that movie connection and it's the specifically the clean romance that she's publishing or just because you were part of the line so she so she grabbed you yeah we were part of that line and she knew i wanted to have my book made into a movie because i kind of freaked out about that oh. <laughs> when it happened she helped me make it happen and that's the book that's being made into a film now yeah, so we filmed last year. It's called Finding Love in Big Sky. So my original book came out was Love Finds You in Sun Valley. Okay. And when I got my rights back, we rebranded it Finding Love in Sun Valley. And my hero was one of five brothers. So I wrote a romance for each of the brothers. And it was Finding Love in Big Sky that they ended up making into a movie. When is that film coming out? I am waiting to hear about that. I know it's released in Canada. I told you earlier I'm a flight attendant, so sometimes I fly into Canada. I was like, hey, I could fly up there and watch my movie. But I think it's supposed to come out in the United States this spring. They got me a blog tour, and I want to do a big red carpet premiere here in Boise where I live. All the actors said they'd be interested in coming up. Not that that would happen, but it's cool that they'd be willing. So I'm waiting to find out for sure, and then I will let the world know. Being released through streaming? Is it small theaters? or? It'll probably be like up TV, because that's a and there's no contract signed yet that I know of. But that's where a lot of their movies have, have come out. So, yeah, I'm waiting to find out for sure. Did you have any say in the screenplay of it or just they optioned it and then you just let them take over from there? Yeah, they optioned it and they asked me for suggestions because to make it a movie, they wanted to hit like all the specific things that movies need. So I gave them ideas and then they gave me the screenplay. And, and it had been so long since I've written the book that I was reading the screenplay and I was like, oh, that's a funny line. Did I write that? Like, I didn't remember what I had written and what I hadn't. That's funny. <laughs> Besides for the excitement that it's a film, it seems that you are pleased with the outcome of it or with what they did with the story. I heard a rumor, so I just, somebody told me that the network in Canada said it was the best 
movie that aired. It is like a sweet romance, like the Hallmarkish type. The actors were so amazing to get to know. The cinematography was really, really beautiful because they filmed it in Montana. They had drones flying over the ranch and they just did a really good to take shots from the air. They did a really good job with it. That's great. And then talk about that these books that make it into Costco, it just seems like they just appear there. But if these books are making it to Costco, it's also because there's some sort of market. There's got to be some big market for it. If people are just right. like, picking up the book, I don't know if they gave you any sort of projections or what to anticipate from that. Or it's just, we have a line to Costco. So if we pick up your book, it's going to get it to Costco. That publisher was that picked me up was doing really, really well at that time because it was a line of books and women would just read all of them. And all these uh -huh. different authors that had tons of readers, all their readers would just read all of the books. So they, they had their books in Borders and Walmart. Those were, I believe those were two really big markets for them. And then all the borders shut down and the Walmarts cut back on what they were selling. And so that affected them and they, they ended up selling and then getting shut down. Oh. So I've written for a few different publishers. I've written for Harlequin. I have some friends here in Boise and we've written for Harlequin together, which has been kind of fun because we've shared an editor and helped each other out with our stories and stuff like that. So yeah, there's been a few different publishers I've worked with. Oh, cool. And Harlequin, have, have those been also clean romances specifically? Or? Yep. Harlequin has all different lines. Yeah. So I wrote for the Christian romance, romantic suspense line. But like you're, you're saying, clean romance, can that be Christian romance? Or, yeah. you know, is that a thing? Yeah, I think there's definitely a desire for it because... Not everybody wants Fifty Shades of Grey. And that's immediately, when people hear I'm a romance writer, that's immediately what they assume I write, that I write erotica. But no, I write like the, the heartwarming stuff, like You've Got Mail and Sleepless in Seattle, those kind of things. Yeah, well, that's a good way of, of explaining that, yeah. So one more second, going back on that, and then, and then we'll jump forward again. How on earth, or I don't even know if you know, how on earth did you get through the book, that first book that you're supposed to write, your whole life seems like it's falling apart, and you're supposed to be like, let's write this sweet, happy ending, heartwarming story. Did you have to just put yourself in a zone? How did you scratch out a book like that? I think though I wasn't happy about it, I think it did give me hope at the same time. Maybe there are still good men out there. And some people, some of my readers, this is their favorite book that I've written. For me, I do, I'm sick of it. I hate, I hate my first book because wow. one, I know I was in a bad place when I wrote it. And two, I've learned so much about writing since then. I think what people like about it is that it's fresh. Because a lot of times, once you've been writing a lot of romance, it becomes a formula. Like, okay, fill in hero's name, fill in heroine's okay. name kind of thing. Because it was written during that time, it was a little bit different than the normal romance. And so people enjoyed that about it. Trying to mentally put the pieces together, but it's just <laughs> each time. I know. Yeah. But it is true. <laughs> it is true that your first book, I think in my first book, I do like the story of it, but I don't know if I'd be able to read it again because I'd probably cringe. Not because the writing's bad, but because I got so much better. Or I'd like to think I right. did. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to think I get better with every book, so yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you have to start somewhere, but you don't want to just mm -hmm. stop at that somewhere. Right. So true. Okay, now jumping back to the whole, you know, Christian romance or clean romance. What would we say, like, would be the parameters for something to be able to fall into that? Because I know, for example, like, Hallmark has, I don't know if it's official, like, an unofficial kiss rule of, like, how long, like, the, the kiss is going to last for it to be, like, a Hallmark kiss or not. So are there things like that where if you're writing a Christian romance, X, Y, and Z is totally not an option. And if you want, you know, ABC to be part of it, you got to make sure that it's like this. Do you kind of know what I'm Yes. Right, yeah, and that varies by publisher. Okay. Um, I wrote for Harlequin because they are known as the steamy publisher. They really had to differentiate their Christian line, and so they are actually stricter than a lot of the other Christian publishers. Oh, wow. So, like, in my Harlequin novel, they're running from the bad guys in Lake Tahoe, and they're staying in a cave overnight. But they have a rule. You can't have a man and a woman together overnight because wow. the normal... Harlequin book that means they're gonna sleep together and right. so they don't even want their readers minds to go there So I had to have my guy sit outside the cave to protect her and keep watch through the night So things like that, but it does vary from publisher to publisher and some of them get a little steamy If you have a romance of a married couple and those are beautiful love stories too in Christian romance You would just close the door when they go in the bedroom type right. of thing, right? Does something define, like, does it specifically fall into the Christian romance because you just have to stick a church in there somewhere or belief in there somewhere? Or a lot of clean romances may or may not mention religion, but they kind of just all get shoved into the Christian romance. There's not really one 
line that divides it kind of roams through the the two different genres but normally the characters are going to be christians and that's going to be their worldview so usually to define a book as a christian book it has to have a christian worldview so back when christian fiction first started out it was there was a pastor and somebody got saved or or however you want to phrase it and that's how it started but now we're trying to get away from the preachiness and just make it about who the characters are. I mean, they have the same struggles as everybody, right? Right. And that's something that I, I really hate preachiness in a book, but I think it can, if it's authentic, it's going to touch anyone, no matter what they believe about God or faith. Well, that's a good point to say that it specifically just influences the worldview. Your background is going to affect the worldview. So it doesn't mean that you just right. walk around talking about it all the time. It just means that that's how you translate information, that the process information that's coming in or right. dictates your behaviors. That's really interesting. I've seen different studies or graphs or something. First, I saw that romance was the number three best-selling genre. And then I see that like maybe it might have moved Edge up to the top of the best-selling genre. Do you feel like romance is just this massive, massive genre? And everyone just thinks it's like, oh, romance. And like, you don't even realize the size of the world of the romance writer. <laughs> It's probably the best selling because romance readers are voracious and they do read a lot. But that also means there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of people writing romance too. So it is a big world and there are good ones and there are bad ones and there's deeper ones and there's shallow ones. And there's what they call tropes. Do you know much about romance tropes? Well, two people got to meet, there's going to be conflict, and then they're going to get back together. Right, That's okay, simplified. so in yeah. the Harlequin world, though, there's like, okay, this is a secret baby book. This is a hidden identity book. This is a marriage of convenience book. Uh -huh. So there's these tropes, and we all have our favorites, and we all have those that we don't enjoy so much, and we might not even realize them. Like, as a, a kid growing up, my favorite book that we read in school was The Scarlet Pimpernel. Have you read that one? It's a book that I know of, but I have actually not gotten around to. Scarlet Pimpernel is the original hero with a hidden identity. Right. And I right. loved this book, but it wasn't until I grew up and learned about tropes and that my favorite trope is hidden identities. But I'm like, no wonder I love that book as a <laughs> kid. So we kind of exploit tropes. And then the romance readers, like if they like hidden identities, then they're probably going to want to read my books kind of thing. Is that similar to same as mistaken identity sort of thing? Or could yeah, be that? yeah. Okay. Well, like I mentioned, you've got mail. Have you seen that? Yeah. So she doesn't know that Tom Hanks is who she's writing to. That's a hidden identity. And I love that. It's like my favorite thing of all time. It's all because you keep mentioning You Got Mail. I never realized that You Got Mail is based on She Loves Me, which is based on Little Shop Around the Corner. And there's like four or five iterations of it. And there's a musical like Jimmy Stewart's in the absolute original version of it. And I was like, what? They just keep making the same film over and over and then updating the technology in it? What? I guess there's something well, about it. You know, that's the cool thing about writing stories is the stories I write could be recreated. They could go last much longer than I ever am alive. So it's pretty cool to think about that as a writer, that what I'm writing today could be changed to be relevant for future generations. We just don't know. It's an amazing possibility. That's a really good point. Just from a technical aspect, writing these romances, what's your general word count on things? Because I'm assuming you're not writing 200,000 word books. You're probably writing 60,000. No. Like, what's your general? Is it standard or yeah. what is it? The Harlequin's going to be about fifty five to 60,000. I also do some novella collections, which those are shorter, and a bunch of us just put them together in right. a collection. I'm doing one now that's twenty five to 35,000 words. But for my full-length novels, it's going to be more about 80,000, and I have written up to 100,000. Wow, 100,000. Well, so it's pretty standard stuff then. Yeah. yeah. When you're getting your ideas for a romance, how do you make sure that you haven't written that story before or that it's because in a way you have, but in a way you haven't, or okay, first start off, make sure you're in a totally different city or make sure you don't do the rancher again. How do you not write the same story again? Yeah, I get that because Mary Higgins Clark books, I could always figure out who the bad guy is because it was the other love interest, you know? So <laughs> I want to be fresh and I want to be unique. For me, I love variety. I don't even read series very often because I'm like, I don't want to continue reading about that character. I want to read about something else. For me, that's something I love. I told you I've become a flight attendant, so now I'm exploring this whole world of crash pads, and I just love researching different areas. But yeah, that can definitely happen. I remember my daughter came down one time, we were watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which she hadn't seen, but there was a scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off where the principal sticks his head through the dog door, yeah. and that was written by John Hughes, and I told her, I said, the same guy who wrote Home Alone wrote this movie, and she said, oh, I can tell. There's a 
to see him head through the dog door scene. Right. And maybe he didn't even realize he did that. I don't know. We probably all do that a little bit in each of our stories. But I do really try to create new worlds and explore different personalities, different flaws that the characters are dealing with. It's fascinating to study psychology and I'm always asking, what if, what if, what if? Because it's also true that part of the reason why your readers are coming back is A, for you, but B, because they do like your genre, assumedly. Mm -hmm. So you can't not give it to them. You're going to have to give it to them. What do you... I don't know if there's a if it's you personally or the genre itself, but there's so many romances where it's always like the bad boy kind of image or like that's going to be the love interest. Is that like a no? Either for you, for Christian romance? Like what? where does that come in with all that? There's some bad boys and there's readers who love them. That's a trope. We're talking about tropes. The bad boy is a trope. And like I said, we all have our favorite and our least favorite. So while some readers do love them in Christian fiction, I don't love them because of my experience with my first marriage. Ooh. I'm just like, oh, it's going to end badly. No. Yeah. So I usually try to avoid that one. <laughs> right. I saw an article about it once, and it was, why do they keep using these bad boys? You would not actually want to meet this person. If the guy has a dark side, whatever, he's troubled. Stay away from him. Stop making them romantic interests. It was funny. Right. So I'm like, it is a lot that there is something about it that attracts the, the imagination somehow. Okay, so here's something that you might not know about, but I think you will be entertained by. In the romance world, a writer tried to trademark the word cocky. So then she went around and tr sent cease and desist orders to every author who had the word cocky in their title, like the cocky billionaire, because that was a trope too. There was lots of cocky and there was lots of billionaires. I'm like, you can't do that. You can't trademark a word like that. And First of all, titles can't be trademarked, but right. it was just like, it's interesting in the romance writer world, these things that happen and it kind of becomes big news in our world, but nobody else knows about it. <laughs> that is, it is so interesting how the writing world could be so small and so big at the same time that people who are in the romance, they may or may not be able to tell you about picture books or picture books right. don't know anything about nonfiction. There's only so many publishers. There's a lot of imprints. There's a lot of other things. It's just so crazy how... It's small and big at the same time. So like what you right. said with that. Are your books also, do they always come out as ebooks and audiobooks? Do you get either of those? Or is it usually just the trade paperbacks? Not usually. Do you often well, get the trade Well, it's varied because yeah. I heard somebody describe the writing world right now as the Wild West. Like everything changed with Kindle. Everything's changing with Audible. People are trying new things that have never been done before and succeeding and kind of pioneering. So my very first book was only a print book. But when I got my rights back to that and re-released it, I did print and ebook. So most of my books are print and ebook now. I have done a few just ebooks. I'll like give it out for free to people who sign up for my newsletter type of thing. So I'll use it as promotion. Or I'll do the novella collections with a couple of writer friends and we'll sell seven books in one collection for like 99 cents on ebook. So many people buy those that we're able to take our kids to Europe for high school graduation type of thing just wow. by selling the 99 cent book. Wow. So there's different ways you can do it and I do have a couple books in audio and I think my newest one is being produced for audio but I haven't heard it yet. That's really painful for me actually is I love listening to audiobooks but I hate listening to my own audiobook. By the time it's being read and I'm like oh no I want to go back and change that <laughs> kind of thing. So yeah that can be painful. Yeah you're like who wrote this? Oh yeah me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Do you see massive disparities between print or audio or an ebook or kind of where you're at, all of them are selling pretty decently? I think it varies and I am not a numbers person, so okay. I should pay more attention to numbers. I just know what my publishers tell me and I know the audiobooks are on the rise right now. Yeah, that's true. Because my publisher is just nobody makes money in print anymore, all the money is in the ebooks. But mm. As an author, yeah. you want it in print, right? You want to hold it in your hands and take pictures with it, don't you? Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> so we still get our print books, but it's don't expect to see so many sales. They're, most of your sales are going to come from ebooks, but that probably depends so much on the publisher, the marketing, everything. Like I was saying, we did those series or the compilations for 99 cents, whereas my current print book, I think it's still like 10.99 for the, that ebook. So there's different trains of thought. There's different ways to do it. I'm still learning well, I guess that's also as an author, you just want to have different options available. You don't want to have only yeah. one, you have all different kinds. Yeah. How does it work now as a general thing? Are you still working with an agent? You still have your agent? Yeah, yeah. So you just come up with an idea, come up with a book, you just tell your agent about it and then let them go off. Or do you now have certain kind of connections to people that you'll contact first? Or like your friend you said who started a publishing company, was it specifically right. for those books? Like where are you at as far as that goes? 
I do both. You mentioned how romance writers don't know what's going on in the picture book world. <laughs> yeah. Last year, I don't know if you saw this in my bio, but I just went through breast cancer. Oh so I, while I was going through that, I wrote a cancer picture book. And so I don't have the connections for that one. So my agent is shopping that one for me. My publisher now with the romance, like they're coming to me now and saying, hey, how about you do this? How about you do this? So that's kind of nice as a work for hire or that they've got, we've got this idea and we, we know you as a writer. So what can you do with this sort of thing? Not work for hire. It's still under my name, but they're like, how about you write more about these characters? How about we put you in a Christmas compilation with um, these other two authors? Oh, very cool. So it seems being in a, either an anthologies or, or compilation, yeah. especially you're, you're selling it for 99 cents. It's like, well, it's worth it because it's going to introduce us to a lot of new readers. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like promotion when you're, we're sharing, we're like, we're cross promoting the same book. So I've had a lot of fun doing that with different authors. As a general thing, or I guess this might also depend on whatever books you've got out, how much marketing do you have to be on top of? Or depending on the publisher, they'll take care of most of your marketing for you? Where do you got to be with that? It varies. The publisher will suggest ideas to me, stuff I can do, or I'll suggest ideas to them. I think every writer has a different style of marketing. My style is that I love books and I love people, so I just want to have fun bringing them together. Yeah. So I've done some things that other writers don't normally do. Okay. <laughs> like we had a Harlequin book signing here at the Barnes & Noble with my writer friend, so I was like, let's get a limo! Stuff like that is really fun to share on social media, and I'm pretty active on social media and with my newsletter so those are the things that are fun for me some things are not fun for me and that's when I'll suggest them to my publisher or they'll set up stuff that they have connections with that I don't have oh because you hear so much that unless you're a big name you know an a-list big name author you got to do all your own marketing as a writer or whatever we're doing I think so often we take for granted the things that we're given to us and don't realize their worth sometimes they just got me some reviews in like world magazine and some other magazines and i i didn't even know about those opportunities or options and i was just like oh cool and then another writer wrote me and she said oh my gosh you're in world magazine that's like my dream oh wow. and i was like oh is that a, is that a good thing <laughs> like i don't know so the publisher has been able to do stuff like that that's pretty cool. Going back to the writing of actual the romance, because it's a Christian romance, does there always have to be done with like an eye toward marriage sort of thing? We understand these two characters are going to get married and end up together if they do end up together. Yeah, so it's definitely marriage is the goal for romance. That's the ultimate romance in the Christian writing world. I'll throw this out there too, because I told you how formulaic romance can be. Every genre has their own formulas. So what I've heard is the breakout novels, the novels that get made into the Harry Potter movies or Twilight or whatever, those books are genre books, but they're written in a literary way. They go a little deeper, a little more provocative, so that they stick with the readers. And so I do have a couple romances that are going to be like that and I don't want to say which ones they are because usually people love it but every now and then I'll get a bad review where they're like I loved it until the end so I do try to make readers think not just tie everything up with a happy bow uh oh okay you don't have to say but please <laughs> tell me you didn't do an open ending do you do an open ending um, not quite. No, okay. no not, not like a cliffhanger ending. So when I was writing more suspense, I did have the opportunity to kill some characters, which I don't do in my normal romance. Oh, okay. My daughter, she like kicked me. She was homesick. She was laying on the couch and I was sitting by her feet and she got to the part where somebody died and she's like, no! And she like <laughs> kicks me. I was like, you can't kick me. And she's like, you can't kill him. I do want to have some plot twists, even though there's a formula. <laughs> Fine. I accept that. Okay. I probably would be annoyed, but it's just, when it's novels that don't have a specific ending and it's not a no. cliffhanger to a series i'm what no don't do this to me those do make you think after it's over there was the first nicholas sparks book i read was a walk to remember yeah and in the movie she dies right right I don't know if you've seen it, but yes. in the book, it never says she dies. It just says he now believes in miracles. And I was like, oh, she lived. Okay, I think there's been one other person was, that thought she lived, but everybody else thought she died. Yeah, and no, I so think she died. I'm, yeah. I'm like, did he do that on purpose? Like, are we all supposed to be arguing about whether she lived or died? Oh, I thought it was clear that she had died. Till you said that, I knew, I was like, what, there's a question? <laughs> did you read the book? I actually did, back in. Okay. I don't really yeah. read the genre so much, but I did read that book. I think that probably says a lot 
about me as the hopeful person where I was like, it didn't say she died. I'm not going to believe she died if it doesn't say she died. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, one yeah. more question. One more question and we'll wrap up. It seems that there's something about, especially with the cleaner romances, that lends themselves to smaller towns. Would that be something accurate to say? Not that you can't have, but you don't often have big city settings. Definitely. I prefer the big cities myself, but a lot of my readers prefer the small settings. In my latest book, I set it in Portland, Oregon. Okay. And so when my book that was made into a movie, we were on set and I went out to breakfast with the directors and I was trying to pitch them this new book and they're like, oh, Portland. They're like, that'd be hard to shoot there. Like that was their response. So I was, oh, you guys like the little towns. And maybe that's why. Maybe maybe the writers set them in little towns so they'll get made into Hallmark movies. But yeah, readers do like it. I'm writing romantic comedy now, which is more like confessions of a shopaholic type. And so those rom-coms are often in the bigger cities. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I wonder if it's just, you know, you have a cozy mystery, so it's just a cozier romance, maybe if it's in a smaller town or, yeah, who knows? Yeah, it's just, it has an intimate feel when it's a small town because everybody knows everybody. Yeah, oh yeah, there you go. That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the books you pick up to read yourself, are they mainly romances? I've been reading a lot of suspense lately. Like I told you, I like variety. So I like anything with a hidden identity. So in suspense, that can be witness protection or amnesia or undercover. So I like those things a lot. Oh, but I guess going back for a second, just to tie two points together, that you said that directors, they, because it is true, shooting a film in a big city is hard. There's way more regulation, way more everything. You get traffic, this, you, know, you have to deal with a lot of stuff versus like, let's just go find a ranch somewhere. That was kind of the thing with Nicholas Sparks that you've mentioned him. Any of the films, I haven't exactly followed them all closely, but Quick Glance, you can see a lot of them take place in small, small places, low budget films. So that's something that... Mm -hmm you don't need a massive studio to pull off for you, right? right? You just have to know there's going to be the audience there for it, and almost anybody can pull it out for you. So that's very smart to make your niche there or something. Yeah, and I think it's also kind of like a little vacation. Like the Love Finds You books, those were all in little resort towns, like Sun Valley, Idaho was mine. So that's like a vacation for the readers too. Yeah. Romance is totally not among any whatever, and this is all so interesting. So like, you don't write romance at all then, is what you're saying? I am one of those people who, in my books, and even though I'm writing for a teen audience, and I've been sometimes urged to add more romance in, and I was like, there will be no romance. Okay, I don't really do it like that, but even I have these five fairytale rewrites, they're not overly romantic, which for myself, I'm kind of proud of that, look, I rewrote Cinderella, and it's not specifically romantic. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's a great twist. Yeah, well, uh, yes, because, you know, there's so many that you want to do something different. But it was just more about, like, examining, is this really a healthy relationship if you just fell in love and married a guy that she doesn't really know? So Yeah, I am going to throw this in there, too. So since I've remarried, I want to write about love, but I also want to write about healthy relationships. So I do go into that in all my romance. It's not just, yeah, let's kiss and live happily ever after. No, there's relationship stuff that we all deal with every day. Oh, very good. That's something that would be very beneficial official especially for the romance genre because you kind of know there's gonna be a happily ever after which i'm assuming is mm -hmm. kind of but you know it's also gonna be realistic some people do love the fairy tale stuff but it's not realistic so right yeah that's very good Intra that's very well, interesting I, i'm glad you wanted to talk about it today even <laughs> though you tried not to write any romance <laughs> my new trilogy the first book there is gonna be almost no romance in the entire trilogy so maybe some listeners now we're not gonna read it but maybe someone will be like, how did you do it? Uh, You'll have to find okay. out. So I do like to challenge myself that way too. I do have one romance novel out there where they never kiss. Uh -huh. And that was just because I wanted to see if I could create that tension. Right. And that feeling without the typical kiss. I don't even know if my readers have noticed because there's so much romance involved without even there being a kiss. That's really, that's very cool. Too. And then I was thinking, which I, I'm sure it's been done somewhere before, but I was thinking for myself, how can you write the most romantic scene without any touch? You know, uh, something like you that. You have to read the Scarlet Pimpernel. Okay, oh well, let's go there. Right. right. There's a scene in there, and I remember my eighth grade English teacher clutching the book to her chest and dancing <laughs> around the room. And she's like, oh, you guys are going to read the most passionate scene tonight. And we were all excited because we were like eighth graders. We run home and we re reread it. And and there's no kissing and we go back and we're like they don't even kiss and she's oh but it's so passionate <laughs> okay so if you are interested you should check that out well, I'll add it to my list of 300 books I've got here that are, yeah. that are waiting to be read. It's that, it's, can you write, and you could, but these are, I guess, ways 
I guess you just proved that you've done this. Can you write about romance without barely using the word love, let's say? You can't just say, oh, I love you. How's another right. way? So we always kind of anyways came around to the answer of how do you keep it different is, well, because you don't always just write, I love you every single time. Yeah, well, do you remember the movie Ghost? I haven't seen it, but I know it. Demi Moore would say, I love you, and Patrick Swayze would say, ditto. He would never say, I love you. And so when he's the ghost and he's trying to tell Whoopi Goldberg, tell her I love her, tell her I love her, Whoopi Goldberg's like, he says he loves you. And she's like, he never said I love you. And then he's like, tell her ditto. And Whoopi Goldberg's all, ditto. And then she's, she's like, oh my gosh, it's uh, real. <laughs> That's how you keep it fresh. Right. They have in the musical version, there's a song for that where the girl asks, well, before he's killed, but how come you never say I love you? And the first line of the song is I, I say with my eyes and when I make you scrambled eggs or something like that is like, oh, the lyrics oh, yeah, I like right. that. Yeah, and you like you hear that and you're like, huh. This is way more interesting. Like, I knew it was going to be different, but this is way more interesting than, than I anticipated. I'm very glad oh, we got to I had fun. I, <laughs> I love talking about it with you. Yay. Okay, so let's wrap up just for these episodes. I always wrap up with the fill in the blank of I really like it when choosing any anyone. Oh, yes. I really like it when Writers, publishers, agents, books, stories, covers, oh, whatever, whichever one you want to choose. And I really don't like it when fill in the blank of whichever one you want to choose. So I really like it when writers use humor, okay. even in suspense novels, even in like 1883, the Western where everybody was dying. Like they just add that little <laughs> dash of humor and it lightens the mood and just makes everything more poignant. So even in the tear jerking scenes, if there's just a little dash of humor, that gets me even more. And then I don't like winking. I don't like it when characters wink, because who actually winks? And in romance, every single romance novel, the guy's winking, like, all over the place. And I'm like, stop it! No more winking! You don't really do that! So, anyway. That's so <laughs> specific and random and funny at the same time! <laughs> So I actually did have one book where my character winked, but I made a big deal out of it. Like, most people shouldn't wink. Like I said that. Most people shouldn't wink, but she can get away with it this time. <laughs> Very good. I gotta go think about it. I'm like, great. Who winks in my book? Let me go check. I'm gonna go search for winking. You don't write romance, so you probably don't have any winking. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about those rogue eyeballs. Instead, my characters roll their eyes a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes mine become bobbleheads because they're, like, nodding all the time. Like, stop <laughs> nodding! That's very funny. Well, there you go. We got our humor in right now. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Well... Okay, I'll just say it, that I've at least ranted to people often, especially if it's a film or book that's got either gratuitous violence or language or even romance, and I'll say comedy is never gratuitous. You've never mm. seen a label of gratuitous, like it might be, you know, in poor taste, but there's no such thing as yeah. gratuitous comedy. Even if stuff, like you said, even if everyone's dying, sometimes you need it just for easing the tension. Right. Right, not to disregard it or disrespect, but because it's very, it plays a very important role. Yeah. I don't yeah. have that much comedy, actually. I should go look at my books and I'm like, wait, does anybody laugh at anything? We all have our strengths. I remember one writer that I love, she was just talking, and her books make me sob. They're so good. And she was saying, I wish I could write to make people cry the way she does. And she's like, I wish I could write comedy. I can't write comedy. And I was like, oh, is that hard? Like, I didn't know, because that's just my strength. That's what I do. So very we all good. have those those areas right and, and there's readers for each areas almost right exactly oh very good angela this was i'm so glad we got to speak thank you so much thank you so much for inviting me this is fun this was a bonus episode of oh my word podcast featuring author angela ruth strong to find out more about angela and her work please check out the link in the episode notes to find out more about oh my word podcast and all the great stuff we're up to check us out on instagram at oh my word podcast or visit eltenabout.com music is by tim burke Thank you so much for joining us. Catch you next time.